kittens in a litter, usually four to six, and that the age that they can no longer have kittens is about 10 years. Um, so using this information, can a cat have 2,000 descendants in, what did it say, 18 months? 18 months. Um, so I'm going to give you guys five to seven minutes um, to just kind of start working on this problem. You can either work on it as a math teacher, or you can start to work on it as you think your students would. Um, but take about five to seven minutes uh, to give that a shot, and then we will come back together and share strategies then. Questions before I mute myself? Liz, you look like you have a question. Yeah, I just, I had to figure out how to get to my unmute fast enough. Um, is there, when we do this, is there anything for how long between pregnancies for a cat? This is the only information given. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, five to seven minutes. I'll start a timer and everything. Hey, Marissa. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Um, so we are starting with a task. Um, you should be able to see it up on the screen. It's the cat problem. Uh, with all of this information, can a cat have uh, 2,000 descendants in 18 months? Okay. So we're going to take another like two-ish minutes on it. Um, you could think of it as a math teacher or think of it as one of your kids would think about it. Um, 
but just take a couple minutes to, and then we're gonna talk about strategies. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, we off screen share, right? Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, finish up your last thoughts on that one. I'm going to type in a Google Doc while you guys are talking, and then I'll share it with everyone after. That way, you all can all like can all still see each other and everything. Um, so first off, what what did you get as the answer? Uh, do you think it is possible for that cat to have 2,000 descendants? I didn't get an answer yet. Okay, that's fine. What were your starting strategies? I agree well, with I, that. I didn't quite get an answer yet either. Okay. I started with somewhat of a timeline table because I thought that's what students would most likely do uh, and try to figure out, okay, every – like start with the, the the first mom, we'll say. Okay. And then how many offspring she would have over the course possibly of 18 months. And then I went with the first uh, litter and started going through and saying, okay, how much could they have over those remaining months? But that takes a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, you're on mute. So I did the same thing. I made a table, but then I made little offshoot tables with each of them and then um, kept multiplying because of the litter. They can all have about five. I said it, it was about five in between five and six. And then I made little offshoots for how many that they would have. And I ended up with more than 2000. Okay. I started trying a tree diagram and it got too complicated. And then I tried to just think through, but I was getting, I was confusing myself with the years and well months. So they have to be four months, but then it's a two month gestation period. So it's six months to have a litter. But then the, the first cat, two months later could have another litter and two months later could have another litter. She could have three a year. And then the first litter, six months later, could have a litter. So I was going with highest counts. So I got, you know, there was the first mom, and then her first litter was six, and then their first litter was 36, and then their first litter would get me to a 216. So 216 plus 36 plus six plus one, 
and then I didn't get all the branches of mom kept having litters and the first litter had more litters and the second litter had a litter. But I didn't think the third litter could have any litters. Okay. In 18 months. Any other strategies that you guys used to approach this? Or strategies also um, that you think your kids would use if they were given this problem? Drawing pictures. If they were given this as a hard copy piece of paper, do you think that would be different? Like they would approach it differently than we just did, seeing it up on a computer screen? I suppose it depends what was on the paper. This would be an awesome whiteboard problem yeah. because they yeah. can erase and rework or jumping off of what Tracy said have individual whiteboards and then um, kind of come together or and because then the the students if they're working in teams could say okay you take the first mom okay you take the this litter and let's let's break it up and you could do that with whiteboards or paper of course but you could also have them, I think, just post it up on a whiteboard or like okay. a blackboard, smartboard, whatever, and then have them use vertical workspaces in small groups to draw it out. And Aisha, I liked how you said breaking up, you work on this litter and their sibling, their descendants and so forth. But I think it's it was key that there was no like um, table already made for us. It was basically just a blank space. Yeah. Let's do whatever. But I could also see if they were working by themselves where they could get frustrated and just be like, I no, I, no. I'm just gonna, you just want a yes or no answer. I'm just gonna pick one and give it to you and not really keep going because I'm confusing myself. Cause I know in my drawings, it's hard to see this, but I mean, I tried cat diagrams, I tried bar graphs and I was just going in circles after a point. For sure. Okay, so I just shared a doc with all of you guys with the strategies that I heard you saying as I was typing. Um, so uh, I want us to kind of look at that together um, and try to think about how we could kind of group those strategies into like buckets, um, similar to what we did during the uh, during the summer, kind of thinking about like what bigger buckets of, of like we can kind of classify them as. Um, I'm seeing a couple right away, um, but I'm curious what you guys come up with first. And I'll type as you guys talk as well. Any ideas for like how we could categorize those strategies? I would say the timeline and tree diagram pictures, those kind of get lumped together as a visual representation of the, the growth. For sure. I agreed. I thought the visual representation and then how the work gets broken up. So the grouping of students working together or not working together would kind of be a different bucket. Thank you. Like, uh, Okay, so splitting up the problem or splitting up the students? Both. Okay. Any other ideas? So uh, if I were to give this to my students on paper, I would want them to mark up the problem, uh, kind of circle the important information, annotate a little bit. Um, Anyone else with that one? It's not one that we said, and that's kind of what I was trying to, uh, I don't know if that was because we were doing it on the computer, and so there wasn't so much that we could like physically mark up, but I think if we were to have had it in front of us, I think a lot of us would have been circling and underlining and annotating. Um, and I think working on the whiteboards, we're implying that they're gonna be writing and marking and drawing and all that. Yeah, definitely, especially if they're on the whiteboards. Uh, Awesome. Okay, so uh, thinking through those, um, uh, if you look back on the handout, I 
think there are some student responses. If you scroll down, there's Alice, uh, there's Wayne, there's Ben, and that's it. Um, so if you look at those three, did those three students use any of the strategies that we talked about or did they use strategies completely separate? We have Wayne with a tree diagram, I think. Uh, yep, that's what it looks like. Oh, Tracy, good, you got the doc. Okay. Did Alice use one of those strategies? I would say Alice used either um, a timeline or I guess, I think it's got tape diagram or such. Yeah. But maybe more so like a, a timeline. Definitely one of those visual representations though. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Ben tried to, although I'm having a hard time following uh, his work on that one. Um, but definitely there was a thought process there that he was trying to get across. Uh, his visual representation is a little pretty. He drew a tree, but it's not really like kind of getting to the, the underlying math of it quite as much as I think some of the others are. And I think that uh, our students would as well. Um, okay. So uh, looking at these strategies, I want you guys to take a, take a second and look at the tile problem. Uh, it's page six of the handout document. We're going to take only like three minutes, but if you read through that problem, how could you use one of our big bucket strategies to approach that problem? Those buckets being pictures, splitting up the problem into maybe smaller pieces, um, and labeling problem and like marking up and annotating. So we'll take like three minutes. Uh, how could you use those? And then we'll share out in a second. All right, my dog is now in my lap. She wanted a little bit of attention, um, but I can still type while you guys are sharing. So this, this tile problem, uh, what are some ways that you could use those strategies? Uh, we'll just share, I'm not gonna type that one, but what are some ways that you could share those, like use those strategies uh, or encourage your students to use those strategies for this type of problem? Well, splitting it up into smaller problems, like you could go from the uh, 20 by 20 to maybe a 30 by 30. I don't know if that counts, but okay. go step by go step by step. OK. 
how would you encourage them to use pictures? Not a trick question, might be kind of obvious. Okay, Tracy's saying pictures and tile paper. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think this is one where you can get all kids drawing pretty easily. Definitely drawing, because I think some of them would might just look at it and be like, oh, well, it's 20 by 20 now, so 40 by 40 means double it. Yeah. Instead of realizing with area, you have to quadruple it. So to make sure yeah. you see that you need four of those pictures, not two of those pictures. Yeah, definitely. I also think that annotation would be beneficial to figure out just all the pieces to the, uh, the actual problem would be beneficial for all the words. Yeah, I definitely wanted to like write on mine the length of each half and the length mm -hmm. of each quarter and things like that. Nice, good. Anything else? Cool. All right, so uh, we spent about the first half of this doing the problems and actually trying out the strategies on our own. The second half of the of the session is thinking about how we could implement this into our own classrooms. So both, uh, well, no, I'm not gonna give anything away. <laughs> um, so thinking about your own classrooms uh, and what we've done for the last half hour, what could you do? What would you do? What are some uh, areas of concern you have with implementation? Because Obviously, it's a little bit trickier with kids um, than with us, um, but what are some ideas that you guys have uh, for implementation? You guys can just call it out, however you want. I think for problems like this, I like to do what we did this summer, and I do random cards to put them in groups and then let them just work. Um, the other thing I did like this summer was every once in a while, they only gave us the problem up on the screen. You didn't have paper, so you had to sit and keep talking to each other to force them to start talking. And I think it depends on the type of group of students you have, if you need to use that strategy or if you could give them the actual handout for them to be marking up. And I think that's just, if it's later in the year, you know that about your students. If it's at the beginning of the year, you don't really know that yet. And then just to piggyback on that, um, to give it out loud, to, to actually read it out loud so that you they all start at the same place instead of the slower readers, it takes a little bit while, you know, a little while for them to figure out what the problem is actually asking and everyone else has moved on to the problem solving strategies. So just by reading it out loud, then you put them all on the same page at once. I think these type of problems would be great uh, at the beginning of the unit, especially to uh, kind of engage them for whatever the unit is going to be uh, covering because uh, these type of problems are engaging. It forces them to talk to each other. And, and I agree with, I believe it was Liz who mentioned about not giving them the, the certain informations or certain uh, visuals because it's really amazing what some of the students can come up with on their own and, a lot of times I end up learning new strategies of how to approach a problem from them. Definitely. What about encouraging students to come up with these types of strategies? Like I didn't tell you guys any strategies to try at the beginning. I just said, here's this problem. Be ready to share your strategies. How could you get students to come up with their own strategies? And then how could you collect them as a class? To get students to come up with a strategy or to share their strategy? Both. I guess for me, for sharing, it's here's your piece on the board. You have to go put something up and everyone's going to walk around and look at them. Right? So they each have to kind of have ownership and go post some. You have to put something on the wall because everybody's going to be able to see it. So make sure they have something to come up with. And I guess I do tend to guide students to be like, when I don't know what to do, I draw a picture to get them thinking. But I don't know if that's too guiding in a situation like this. I think it definitely depends on the kids with that one. And I think it also depends on how long they've been working on it. You know, if they're stuck and they're frustrated, they just need that prompt to, to start. So whatever, they, but if they're starting on their own, you know, kind of leave them alone. I think if you had them on vertical whiteboards, it'd be easy to just be like, look over there, what was their strategy? Or, I mean, 
you, you wouldn't have to do as much prodding to get them to share. Other thoughts or ideas on implementation? You can always just give them a hint also in terms of, uh, you know, remember, remember some of the strategies that we've gone over before that we've used before in past classes and just sort of put that bug in their ear without giving them any, any hints of what the strategies they could use. Yeah, definitely. One of the things I probably would add to the question is to have them justify their reasoning, um, especially with the cat problem, because some of them would say yes or no. Right. Because <laughs> I guessed or you know I estimated or something like that but then to justify it mathematically to be able to communicate it and explain it so like that one kid's problem where it was all kind of a mess um, even asking him will somebody be able to follow your reasoning just by looking at your your strategy Well, and I thought that Ben one, yeah, the tree was a mess, but if you really read what it was, like, he was really thinking about it. He said, like, oh, if she, you know, gets pregnant in June, she can have the baby in August, and then she can have the next litter. And, like, he did try to get some tree diagram out. Obviously, he took that literally, but he did have three branches of three litters with six branches on each. So there was something there. I wouldn't have been, like, he has no idea what he's doing. He just needed a little push. Yeah, 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 for sure. All right, so we started to kind of mention them, but what are some uh, concerns that you have? Some areas uh, like misconceptions that might come up about uh, either these kinds of strategies or how to approach problems without being given a strategy? Like what are some uh, concerns or misconceptions or um, issues that you see arising with classroom implementation? I think some students just kind of give up quickly. They don't have that perseverance. And something like this, you do have to push through and, and actually think. So I think that that's, uh, I could see that being an issue in, in my class. Other concerns around implementation? They might ask, like, how do I do this? So sometimes I'll have students say that, well, how do I, how do, I do this? And, and just giving them the response of, well, just think about it. What do you think would work? They're not, they're not so happy with that response. No, they're definitely not, but I give that response a lot. <laughs> I don't know, would students, I think the timing can be an issue. Like too much time versus too little time. Like, if you give me too short of a time, I get frustrated because, like, I could have gotten there and now you, I was working and you stopped me. And then it's the same on the other end. Like, I'm stuck. I don't want to do. I'm bored. And now I'm going to get bored and start doing something different. So finding that right balance of time for struggle and time to intervene, I think, could be a challenge. And it's different with every group, too. Yeah, it's, it's, all the groups are at different places. So one of them may be struggling and frustrated and the other one needs more time. So it's tricky if you have a whole class. Uh, so then what are some ways that we could, uh, oh, hi, someone else joined, hi Alex. Um, so what are some ways that we could try to fix these, these concerns? Uh, what are some things that we could do either proactively or when they arise um, to help students with this idea of problem solving strategies? So I mean, students give up and need to think through it. We can start there. So like, what are some ways that, that we can either proactively or in the moment help them to not give up. I think it's important that students know it's okay to not get an answer right away. Like they have to understand the idea of struggling with something is legit and it happens. But when they're getting frustrated to kind of give them a hint or point them in the right direction so they don't just shut down. And that's kind of what Tracy was saying earlier. 
Yeah, you have to create that culture in your class from the get-go. What are some ways that you do that? Um, Anyone? What are some ways <laughs> that you guys create that start? Like create that culture of like, it's okay to struggle. It's okay to not give up. It's okay to like come up with strategies and problem solve and all of that. What are some ideas and ways? I verbally tell them. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it gives legitimacy to, to their struggle but also encouragement to say no that you know push through and so some, when a student tries to take some more time to actually figure out the problem i praise them for that for that you know push versus getting the right answer it's, you know i'm not so much concerned with the answer i i want to see how you got there is what i usually say and from the start of the year just doing problems where they're not going to get an answer right away so that they see that this is the norm and it's okay. I read them that uh, butterfly story about the kid, the boy who gets the chrysalis and is watching it and the butterfly is struggling to get out. And he just, the butterfly is not going to get out. And so he takes scissors and cuts open the cocoon. And then the butterfly kind of flops down because it needed that struggle. To, to get out of the cocoon and and I tell them I want them to fly so <laughs> I'm not going to cut out their cocoon they're going to have to figure out a way to get out that's good I like that oh my gosh can you share that story yeah sure sure, sure. <laughs> I kind of right do the same thing I encourage them at the beginning like it's okay if we don't know something and it's okay if we don't get to the answer as long as we're working on getting moving forward in the problem that yeah. it's not the end result that i care about and that's what aisha was saying too it's, it's not the end result but showing me your problem solving and your process of what you're thinking about to get to wherever you got thank you tracy thank you um so something that i do i do uh, lottery tickets for group work and so when they're working in the group if i hear a great strategy or if i hear some great math vocabulary i give tickets for that more so than if a kid raises their hand and says i got the right answer I don't necessarily reward that right away. So that kind of goes with praising for the struggle. Um, something else that I did recently was I had kids make a, instead of this, do this. Uh, so we made two different chart papers and kids would raise their hands and give things that they currently do when they are stuck or struggling. Uh, so they said like giving up or going to the bathroom or uh, getting up and walking around. And so that was kind of cool to see them owning all those things that they do that we know they do when they are giving up, but we, sometimes wonder if they are aware that that's why they're doing it. And, uh, and then we said, okay, so instead of raising your hand, asking to go to the bathroom, what could you do instead? And they made this whole list of all these great ideas uh, and they made them on their, their own. I just wrote them down and didn't prompt them in any way. And then hanging those up in the room. Now, when they get stuck, I can be like, okay, instead of shutting down, pick one of those things instead that you can do. Um, and so that was kind of cool to see them make that list on their own and own those strategies. Uh, themselves as opposed to me just telling them like hey instead of giving up you should try harder uh, they kind of had their own ideas uh, Ariel what were some of the things that they came up with themselves for what they could do differently um they said ask their group members they said uh read the problem again they said like skip it and come back to it um, and we made a point to differentiate between just skip it all together that was on the instead of doing this instead of skipping it all together you can skip it and then come back to it when you're ready uh, so that was one of the good ones um, i can take pictures of those and, and share those out with you guys too i still have the posters i just didn't raise them but yeah there were some there were some good ones on there they did not come up with the three kind of, or they came up with annotating and marking up the problem. That was a something they came up with. They did not come up with like splitting up the problem or splitting up the group to work on parts of the problem. Uh, and they don't really think they talked about pictures. I'm a big fan of pictures and tables and they did not jump right to the, that conclusion. Uh, so that was their, their answers to that one. Any other thoughts on uh, implementation concerns or fixes?
This is more so uh, extension, but how do you use them, uh, these type of problems? Do you use them uh, at the beginning of a unit, the end of the unit, and then depending on what you say? Um, I, so I don't use them nearly as much as I wish I did. Uh, DC Public Schools has a really strict curriculum, and I'm still trying to figure out how to best fit good problem solving uh, into that. Um, at my old school, what I would do though, is I would try to do the kind of towards the end as a review. Uh, so kind of give the, the big challenge problems and then use that as an opportunity to pull smaller groups to work on skills that they're missing, uh, which had pros and cons because it allowed me the time to pull those kids, but then those kids didn't get to work on the challenging problem. So uh, definitely not a perfect solution to that one, but I'm curious what other people's answers are to your question as well. See, I tend to do them more at the beginning because I know that at the end I'm going to be catching up. <laughs> so it's like the only time that I can get myself to do them without feeling bad about it. I tend to do one in the beginning and then, uh, and then branch off of that for the unit. So it's just, I was curious in terms of linking uh, these type of problems specifically to the standards of that particular unit. But uh, my follow-up question, in a sense, then, for, for you doing it at the end of the unit, do you find that students make those connections on their own of what they have learned, not just in that unit, but in general? Do you see them making those connections? Not as much as I would like. Uh, there always are those couple of great kids that are like, oh, we learned this. Let me flip back in my notes and figure that out. Uh, and then there are a lot of kids that don't necessarily see the direct connection with the content and the skills that we just learned and the challenging problem that goes along with it. Um, so ideas on that from you guys would be great as well on how to like kind of merge the two together. Um, we've been doing more investigations in class, but they're not quite so open-ended. They definitely lead to what I want them to know by the end. Um, for example, right now we're doing dilations. And so we gave investigations about like, well, here's the pre-image, here's the image. What is the scale factor? What did you discover about the coordinates for the scale factor? And it was very much like, hey, look, multiply by the scale factor on the coordinates, as opposed to them really struggling with that on their own. I do these kind of problems instead um, on what we call throwaway days, like if there's a fire drill or if it's the last day before break. Um, I, I don't ever show movies. I tell them I'm not a movie teacher. And so we do that instead of the, instead of nothing really. So that way I feel like we're doing something, they're engaged, they're, they're thinking. Um, and it's, that's what I do to deal with. Cause we have curriculum too that I've got to get through and it's tricky to fit those in. But on the throwaway days, I feel like I can use those. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I, I'm the question person. I, sorry, I always have questions. <laughs> but uh, because I, I feel for you guys in terms of the curriculum, because I'm in the same boat, especially this year versus prior years, um, I, don't, I feel like I don't have as much autonomy as I used to. And um, when I made the switch over to our, our middle school or our junior high. And so um, how have your, one, do you share these type of tasks with your colleagues? And two, how do they take it? Do, are they uh, on board or they push back and say, no, I, I'm sticking by the book? Uh, for me, I definitely share with, um, with my colleagues and we definitely all work together and we're on the same page about what we wish we could do. And then it's just kind of like working together to figure out, okay, how do we actually do that? I share. Uh, this probably goes back a little too far that I always do these types of activities for the opener for like a unit. So I've been teaching calculus this year. So to find area under curve, starting with integration, I gave them just a random curve that I drew. I don't know the equation of the graph. I don't know what the actual area is. And I said, approximate the area. And that's all I said to them. Now, I had some students that have taken calculus before, so they kind of knew. And I had some that started looking in their books. I'm like, what are you doing? No, like just just this is all you get. You don't get to look at anything else. Yeah. And by making them do that, I thought it helped them appreciate doing Riemann sums and then getting to the actual fundamental theorem of calculus and doing integrations. But it helped them understand the limit definitions so much better because they could break it down and visually compare what they did 
with what they then had to do. So I find I like to use those things to help them appreciate the quote unquote shortcuts of math to help them solve problems. So that's, and they've come to know that that's what I do at the beginning of every single unit. So they kind of look forward to it. They look forward to being in groups and working in structure. Okay, so with 15-ish minutes left, what are some next steps? Like, are you gonna go in on Monday and give the cat problem? I, or like, you know, how, especially with this weird little couple of weeks be between now and winter break, uh, what are some ways that we can try to implement within the next couple of weeks or maybe when they come back from break is a great time to reset and make sure that they're good with that sort of thing? Like, what are some ideas that you guys have for next steps for yourselves and for your kids. I actually really like that cat problem. Um, I teach them at the community college. I do have a lot more flexibility in my curriculum. And so one of the courses I'm redesigning for the campus, which is math for elementary education. So I basically am teaching sixth and seventh grade math to them. And so we're starting patterns and equations on Monday. So I actually think your cat problem might be perfect to get them started with and the tile problem because we just finished geometry. So. Thanks, Ariel. Those are fantastic. I'll be using no them. No problem. <laughs> I will definitely be using the cat problem. We start exponential um, functions in our integrated one and our eighth grade math. So that's like the perfect opener for that. And especially my eighth grade math uh, groups really need to work on persisting through problems. So this would be a good conversation starter. I get to my exponentials next semester, so I'm definitely saving it in my back pocket. And likewise with me, I, I'd like to, to give them that problem, maybe um, halfway through the, the unit just to see what they do or the end, as you suggested. Uh, but also, I wouldn't mind giving them the tile problem in my algebra class or even my um, math eight class just for them to grapple with it to see how a, uh, a pattern, because that's actually what we're working on right now, is how a pattern grows at a constant rate. So just to have them visualize and see this as a different pattern with a different growth rate would be beneficial for them. I like how Marissa said she's putting it in your back pocket. I find my back pocket gets really overstuffed sometimes with things and I like forget yeah. what's back in there, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that too, which is why I really like these reconnect sessions because there's definitely so many things that we talked about this summer that I went and then jumped into the curriculum and completely forgot about it. And then we started talking about them and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember learning about that. I should totally do that. Um, so I definitely appreciate the coming back together and, and reminding and I'm hoping that next weekend's uh, PCMI and DC helps with that as well. Awesome. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns, last ideas from anyone? Just thank you. This has been wonderful. Uh, great ideas and, um, and thinking. Thank you for, and reflection. Yeah, this was great. Thank you so much, Ariel. I love those ideas. I'm excited that I have a week's worth of lessons now, but awesome. what I did, I had like a whole worksheet of patterns, but I like these even better just to get them struggling a little bit. And then I dive, like I said, I, I give them something bigger, dive into it, and then I keep going. So thank you so much. This was awesome. I wish one or all of you had been my math teachers while I was going through school. <laughs> Thanks so much for letting me uh, listen in. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys all for getting up early. I appreciate it. Um, I apparently didn't know time zones, so sorry I was late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not a problem. And uh, Tracy, good job being up super early again, so thanks. Our West Coast representative, I love it. And Ooh. you're both West Coast. Nice. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you, ladies. This was fantastic. We have another one in January, you know, after all our fun festivities of holidays and mid-semesters and midterms come back. So uh, I'll be looking forward to sending out those emails, and I hope to see everybody then. Great. Thank Lynn. you. Lynn, oh. can you stay on for a minute? I want to ask you something about 
I got a request from someone at a community college the other day. I just want to run something by you. Absolutely. And did we also want to take a screenshot of the pictures like we did last time, Liz? Yeah, that's a good idea. Do you want to do it? Uh, yeah. Do you know how to, does anyone have a PC? Because um, I'm on a Mac right I, now and I always forget what the control something something. I think is. Ian just yeah. took a photo. The man shift four. Yeah. Command shift four. Thank you. All right. So uh, command. Are we still doing our thumbs up or do you guys want to come up with a new little logo? Last time we all did thumbs ups. <laughs> you know. On our nose. <laughs> <laughs> Not it. <laughs> all right. Well, whatever you decide to do in three and two and one. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, guys.